Hello everyone, this is Denise at Something Beautiful Handcrafts. And I just want to talk a little bit about my Etsy shop today. So, at the end of every uh, video and somewhere in the description, I always say something about visiting my Etsy shop. But I never actually tell anybody what's in my Etsy shop. I never really show anybody what's in my Etsy shop. So, um, you know, here's the thing. Like, I've had this channel for a while. And I finally got a decent amount of subscribers. And uh, it's okay. But I st I'm still in that mode that, you know, I'm still working on things. And like for the three people that watch my videos, I really appreciate you guys. And so I really haven't, um, you know, I don't really know when you get the feeling that you've arrived. But I'm not, I haven't really felt that feeling yet. So I don't really talk much or press about the things that I'm doing um, outside of whatever the tutorial is in the video. I'm, I'm not very uh, self-advertising, uh, as my mother says, it, and it's very true. I, I don't promote myself very much, and so I don't really talk about uh, what I'm doing. I don't talk about the projects. I don't really talk about my Etsy shop, and everybody else has these wonderful blogs about the day in the life of an Etsy owner, or they talk about uh, packing orders and all that kind of stuff. And I never say anything about that. So, I mean, the Etsy shop really doesn't get promoted and I really don't do much with it, but I do have one. So I figured I would start, you know, just sharing a few videos about the Etsy shop and what's actually happening and what's inside of it. All right, now, and I'm going to try to make this not awkward. Like I said, I'm not much promoting myself. I can talk forever about different types of fibers. Uh, but if I start trying to promote myself or sell something, that's pretty much the end of that conversation. So I'm trying not to make it awkward. All right, anyway, what you have in front of you here is the Merino from the die over die video and if you recall from the videos before that it was a bright electric blue and there's nothing wrong with bright electric blue I like bright electric blue I just didn't want 40 pounds of bright electric blue and I thought maybe it might be easier to sell if it wasn't bright electric blue honestly I just thought maybe I don't know maybe you all want a bunch of bright, bright electric blue merino if you do just let me know in the comments I don't have to go through the trouble of over dyeing it, but just in case, I figured I'd give it some other color. When you are over dyeing, you have to take into consideration that you have something that is one color. You're going to make it another color and you want these colors to be complementary. You don't want to over dye with something odd and you'll wind up with a muddy color or it'll brown out. So I had this bright blue. I had some choices. It's not possible to make it lighter, of course. So I'm going to make it darker. Then I have to decide what colors going over it are going to give me something nice. So I wouldn't want to put a green over top of a bright blue. Because I would wind up with, hopefully, we'd like to hope it would be like an army, dark army green, camouflage green, green. More than likely, it would be some ugly shade of brown. Uh, and not a good shade of brown, an ugly shade of brown. What happened is I used... Oh, what did I use? Was it a, I think it was a periwinkle. Might have been a cobalt. I might have to look at that video again. Uh, if you haven't watched it, it's about a week and a half or so back from this one. If I remember, I will uh, put a link to it. If I remember. At any rate, it was another blue. A periwinkle or one of those other sky blues or something. A little darker. And I got this really nice dark blue. And I actually got two types of blue. I got a kind of a oh, I have a name for it so I don't remember what it, but it's, it's a dark blue then I got a really dark blue and this one is almost navy right here okay so you know what maybe this would be a, a true blue I think that might qualify as a true blue and then this one is kind of like a navy really nice and of course I got the variation because I did not stir the pot and uh I put some blue dye in and then it didn't seem like it was enough blue dye so I put more 
If I hadn't put more on, I probably would have got it all to this true blue. But I put more across the top, and that's how I got that darker blue. Turned out very nice. Then there was a small bit left, and after I dyed the pink roving, which was a fuchsia, I know that for a fact, I poured the fuchsia over top of the electric blue and got this really nice royal purple here. Okay, so that's how that worked. At any rate... Um, what I want to talk about here is the bat making process. If you are a hand spinner, and I mean you only hand spit, and let's say that you buy all of your fiber roving, and I do know spinners who do that. There's nothing wrong with that. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is if you don't buy raw wool or at least scoured wool, then you might not be aware of what it takes in the process to get it from that raw roving into a bat. And I have found starting this, well, it was a hobby that I just did for myself and it wasn't a problem, but trying to turn it into something that would keep me afloat in between jobs. Here's what I discovered is it's just not economically viable. And I will tell you why. First of all, there's a lot that goes into having a raw fleece. If it has not been skirted, and it might not be depending on how much you paid for it, then you must have an area where you can lay this stinky, smelly fleece out and skirt it. And it is very important that you skirt. I like how there was a a lady in the machine knitting group who pointed out that a lot of times commercial wool, I don't know if I want to say a lot of times, but I think I might want to. Commercial wool yarns, commercial wool items, peel, P-I-L-L. -L. And the reason why they peel is when you send fleece to a commercial processor, they don't skirt fleece. They take these shortcuts and they take whatever the prime blanket is. They send it all through. So you have all these little shorts inside the fiber. When the yarn is spun, the shorts don't grip like the other staples do. And eventually what happens is they will begin to work their way out of the yarn. When they work their way out of the yarn, that's what the pills are. Those little nips of shorts that have worked their way out of the actual yarn to the garment. And that's where people get the idea that wool is like that because these commercial wools are like that. When you're a hand spinner and you're working with raw wool, you, it's best for you to remove all of those. And most experienced hand spinners who are skirting fleece will remove these shorts and second cuts from their yarn. And depending on the fiber or how fastidious they are, they will separate the fibers into different lengths. Okay, so there, there are shorts, there are second cuts, there's prime, there's seconds and thirds and stuff like that. Not only do they differ in quality of the texture of the fiber and the micron count, but they, they differ in the lengths. So, you know, you want to remove that. So you have that first, you're removing that, you're laying that out, it's smelly, you're removing anything else that might be in their tags or whatever. And so after that, you're doing the washing and almost always it's more than one wash, unless you like to spit in a grease, then maybe you get away with one cold wash, depends on your fleece. Then after that, it's, you have to lay this out to dry. Just all this stuff takes time and room. Fleeces don't dry in an hour. Sometimes they take days. You know, they're outside. They're subject to the conditions of the wind and the rain and all that kind of stuff. So then after that, you've got this nice clean fleece. And some fleeces, when they're, after they're washed, they will lay out and they will still be in their lock form. You can do that. You can get away with that. But a lot of times they're jumbled up like this. So now you have to separate them. Because you cannot feed this into the drum carter the way it is. Like this fleece is scoured. It's clean. It's scoured. It's dyed. And this has been dyed twice, twice of course. So that kind of changes things a little bit because it's merino. 
But for the most part, you cannot send this through the drum carter like this. You cannot. It will not come out a smooth bat. You will have all sorts of lumps and bumps. When the spinner spins that, that's going to cause nips. Okay. And they are going to work themselves out, especially with a wool like merino, which in general is relatively short staple. Okay. Also, it can break the fleece and you're going to get some more nips in there. And then two, no matter how nicely done this was, it's the carding process that removes the shorts. So since this has been scoured and dyed and never carded, I've still got some shorts in here that need to be removed. And they're going to turn into naps if I don't remove them. So I cannot send this through the drum carter as it stands. Now already, I know you're thinking, why wow, that's a lot of work. And yes, it is. So uh, I don't even know if you can, can you, yeah, you can see that. Okay, see that, those little nips over there? Those have got to be removed. And I'm going to lose some percentage of the fleece when I run this through. So we already know that's going to be a loss right there. Now, drum carters aren't magic. I do have a video about drum carding uh, Angora, and I might have another one about regular drum carding a little while back. Drum carters are not magic. You just don't take this big mass of yarn or, or fiber and send it through and you've got this wonderfully smooth bat. It doesn't work like that. Okay, so I need to separate this. Tease this out. Try to remove as much of the nips and stuff as possible now. It'd be so much easier if I just did it now. Okay. Then I'm going to get this ready and turn this on here. Okay. And even still with that, I can still see some things I would like to pick off the drum carter. Okay. Now, I'm going to fill this carter, drum carter up. And I think that's about two ounces when I fill it up, right? After that, the bat is not technically going to be smooth. So I will take it all off and run it again. We're already up to hours within the process. And so let's say that I was charging minimum wage, which in uh, Ohio is uh, $8, I think. $8.15 it might be. I would easily reach the cost of, the going cost of a bat on Etsy for like, this is like $24 for a basic bat. Oh, I've already exceeded that. So as you can see, this is not particularly economic. Okay, I'm not really going to put gas in my car or uh, anything else this particular way. The most economical way to make bats, if you're planning to sell them, would be from roving. And roving in itself is an investment. So that's just kind of how it is. I think, I, you know, I don't know what most fiber artists do because... A lot of them don't want to talk about what they do because they want to sell, so they don't want to give you trade secrets. But I assume a lot of the ones, or at least the ones I've seen on uh, YouTube who do tell you what they do, a lot of times they do use bats. And they're breaking up the different colors from the bats. So uh, there are people who wonder why I don't sell more bats uh, and things like that and why I don't sell a lot of uh, hand spun yarns because this is pretty much the process I'm working from. I love raw wool. I have found a few sources of roving that I like, and but it's not enough variety for me to use only roving because generally uh, there are some there's some decent cheviot in roving form not really my favorite i think it's generally scoured to death um the merino i've gotten in roving form i actually got from a local mill local person uh, who does stuff at a local mill and so i did like it but ordering it from a, the um companies that do wholesale and bulk was really not my favorite thing to do. So I just didn't, I found I didn't really like the roving that much. And 
that does present a problem right there. Okay, so here I am again. And I'm going to be at this for a while before I can get something that I can present to you as a bat. So I'm going to do this. And I'll be back when I have enough fleece on this drum carter. Then we're going to mix in the angora. So it's been about an hour to go through all that. And in, it worth, in an hour, I've got about an ounce worth of fiber. So you can imagine if I'm going through the merino and carding and everything, if I want to come out with a nice smooth bat, it's going to be about it's a couple hours to do this. When it comes to the economics, if I'm working at minimum wage, $8 an hour, uh, that's already $32 just for this stage of the game. So while raw wool might be more economical for a hand spinner, you are losing in time. So I'm just going to be honest right there. And if you are trying to sell your goods, afterwards sell your bats, you're going to have to press your bats easily in the 40 or more dollar range in order to recoup the amount of energy and time you've taken to make the bats, which like I said, is pretty much one of the reasons I don't kind of push my, the items that I make in order to turn it into a business because the way I am producing things, um, they would be so expensive. It just would not be um, feasible to sell them, but I enjoy the raw wool. So this is kind of how I do things. Now, um, I'm going to stop the video here because if I don't it's going to be a, a long video i try not to make my videos more than 20 25 minutes long uh, just based on the youtube statistics uh, most people don't last longer than 10 minutes anyway i know there have been some people who said they want long form videos but i just really can't see myself talking more than 15 20 minutes at the most i don't even know how to talk through an hour video or even a sitting and spinning for an hour like that. I don't, I kind of don't have that kind of time uninterrupted just to sit and spin for an hour. And then I have to try to choose music or just, it's just weird to put that much time into a video. And also when you have a file that large, uh, the uploading is complicated if you don't have like super fast Wi-Fi, which I don't. So th that kind of timing is prohibited. I like to keep it short. And maybe I can get a few people who will actually watch through the entire video. Okay, so anyway, keep posted for the part two where I get more of this carted out. And then I show you the other uh, bats I'm working on inside of the studio. Thank you for watching this video. If you found anything useful in this video, please click the like button. If you would like to learn more about the fiber arts, spinning, weaving, knitting, crochet, or even occasional sewing, go ahead and click that subscribe button. If you like to support the channel, you can visit my blog or you can take a peek at the Etsy store and see if there's anything in there that you'd like. Or you can buy me a coffee through the links. Have a great day.